the top five Edgar G. Elmer films. Why are we talking about this director, Edgar G. Elmer? First of all, Edgar G. Elmer is the mascot of the Important Cinema Club. On a more topical note, his masterpiece, his consensus choice for best movie, Detour, from 1946, is being released this week by Criterion in a new restoration. And we would like to piggyback on that release. Today. Elmer Mania. <laughs> yeah, Elmer Mania. It's, it's like Beatlemania. His, People are just his running name down. name is on everyone's lips this week. So Edgar G. Elmer, for me, was someone that I got obsessed with because his career and the way that he made movies are so representative of who he was and are also kind of an ideal that you wanted an artist, someone who didn't have anything and who had to make art out of that is so intoxicating that when you look at his filmography, you're like, oh... I want to find those gems, like Detour. Edgar G. Elmer has always been the extreme test case for auteurism. Mm. Somebody who worked in impoverished conditions, working at the lowest studios, working in the lowest genres, and yet somehow miraculously creating masterpieces, or if not masterpieces at least, isolated moments in movies. Uh, every Edgar G. Elmer movie has at least one or two little glimmers where if you're panning for gold, you can say, ah, there it is. There's those expressionist shadows. <laughs> or there's a little bit of fog in the frame. Hey, did you see how that camera moved? <laughs> like, yes. That's what you're looking for in Edgar G. Elmer films. So, you know, I love Edgar G. Elmer because he's the ghost in the machine. Mm. I like feeling that presence, but also... To love Edgar G. Elmer, I think you have to be just a little bit insane. Yes, because you're looking for something that is not only not a parrot, but probably <laughs> doesn't even exist. The best Edgar G. Elmer movies, uh, it's there. So Edgar G. Elmer came out of Germany. He is a very big myth maker. In interviews near the end of his career, he said that he invented the moving camera, <laughs> that he is the one who designed the sets on Metropolis. So we don't know if he worked on Metropolis, uh, it is possible that he was on the set with a hammer, mm -hmm. uh, hammering in some nails on the set. We do know that he did work with F.W. Murnau, mm -hmm. and that he did work on Sunrise. We don't know in what capacity that was. He came to Hollywood where his first big studio movie, it wasn't his first movie, but his first big studio movie, The Black Cat, ought to have elevated him to the Hollywood A-list, but uh-oh, he ran off with the wife of the nephew of the, the head of Universal Pictures. Mm -hmm. And so for the next 10 years, he was blackballed from all the Hollywood studios. He was making uh, Yiddish musicals in New York. Venereal disease films, which he did in Canada. <laughs> he was making movies with all black casts, uh, which... Uh, were the least prestigious genres that you could get at the time. He's someone that when you hear his life story, you almost wish to be like, why couldn't you have gone and done something else? <laughs> like, you could have been happy doing any other work, but he couldn't because he was an artist and a filmmaker. That's the only way that he could express himself, and that's what he did till the day that he died. And finally, he was allowed back into Hollywood working at Producers Releasing Corporation, which was the lowest studio uh, on the food chain, mm -hmm. making uh, women in prison films. Shot in a couple of days, no money, no sets. They were sold um, as a package package to cinemas that you had to take these B pictures and put them usually at the bottom of the bill. Uh, oftentimes they were called the chaser because it would chase everybody out of the theater. And the economic model was theaters would pay a flat rental fee for these movies. They would play a week and uh, then they'd return them. And the theater owners would be able to keep whatever profit after recouping that flat rental fee. And I mean, if a really artsy Bowery Boys movie came along, <laughs> the Bowery Boys audience might say, what the hell is this? Yeah, don't challenge me. Just give me the same gruel that I eat every <laughs> week when I come to the cinema. And eventually, Edgar G. Elmer started making some pretty good movies for producers releasing Corporation, including Detour. Uh, he wanted a raise. Hit the road. Hit the road. You know, he made a couple of sort of mid-budget movies, and then in the 50s and the 60s, it was back to just scrounging for whatever work he could get, making uh, nudist camp films. <laughs> That's right. Uh, making very Z-grade science fiction films, making historical semi-epics in Europe. That were often directed by somebody else because they needed two names to put on the bill for tax credit reasons. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, every now and then, a good movie, a good scene. And we got five of them for you today. First, we should say what Detour is because it's not going to be on our top five list. No, it's Detour, too obvious. it's too easy. That's like when you do the top 10 Godzilla film. It's like, yes, okay, the original Godzilla is at number one. We know. Why am I clicking through all these pages? Sure. I like that Godzilla is your example. <laughs> yeah, as like opposed to what? Orson Welles or... 
Kane. Yeah, Citizen Kane is number one. Sure. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> if you weren't Desert Island, which one you would go for? <laughs> Godzilla. <laughs> So Detour, like you said, is the purest example of Edgar G. Elmer. It's short and sweet. People walk through New York City that's just a stage bowed lot with one lamppost and fog. The thing about Edgar G. Elmer is, you know, he could make something out of nothing. And so he couldn't film in New York. Mm -hmm. So what he had was a street lamp and some fog. Yeah. And that's the sad New York of the lead character's memory. And it works. It's a road movie that goes nowhere, that just kind of ends. When you feel the third act should be kicking into play, it just hits its brakes and the movie is pretty much over. But so many powerful images, uh, great performance. Giant coffee cup. By Anne Savage. <laughs> you know, I, lo I love seeing that camera move in and uh, it rests on Tom Neal's dopey face and oh. then the flashlight comes out. And the fact know? that like Tom Neal has so much like intertextual baggage <laughs> to his, the character that he's playing that the actor himself like murdered his wife which is what uh, is accused of in <laughs> Detour. Uh, speaking of extra textual baggage I mean like Tom Neal in Detour Edgar G. Ulmer is someone who was thumbing a ride to Hollywood success until fate stuck out its foot and tripped him. Yeah, him cheating with the uh, boss's wife. Right, that would be the fate that <laughs> stuck its uh, foot out. But they remained together and she worked as his script assistant throughout his career. That's right. And, you know, because Edgar G. Ulmer scholarship requires you to just be a little bit insane, mm -hmm. you start, like, projecting a lot <laughs> onto these movies. You start being like, oh, yeah, this is Ulmer responding to the uh, tragic circumstances of his career. The Naked Dawn, as a certain critic named Francois Truffaut said, I know that a good man made this movie. <laughs> Edgar G. Elmer was Francois Truffaut's favorite Hollywood director, according to him in an interview. <laughs> that is the position of a contrarian, though. Someone looking for something that no one has <laughs> talked about yet and claiming it for their own. But you know what? He's maybe my favorite Hollywood director, too. <laughs> yeah, get out of the way, Orson Welles. I love Elmer. And speaking of projecting extra textual information onto objects that may or may not invite it... I'd like to start by talking about his final film, The Cavern. He had a higher budget than normal on this one, and unlike a lot of his films, this was an actual labor of love. It was shot in the early 60s in Yugoslavia um, with an all-star international cast. John Saxon! Larry Hagman. <laughs> uh, all the stars. And at this point, Edgar G. Elmer was so ill that he had to use oxygen when he was working on the film, I believe. It was a very troubled production. It was shot in this, I guess underground cavern or wherever it was that they shot it. Very unpleasant, cold working conditions. The director did not get along with the cast. Oh, John Saxon in a documentary on Elmer says that like, ugh, worst movie ever worked on. Well, he's wrong. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's worked John on... Saxon has worked on a lot of bad movies. And yes, Elmer's health was failing to such an extent that apparently one day he woke up blind. Oh my God. It's a real uh, Woody Allen in Hollywood ending. <laughs> And yet, it is a very good movie. It tells the story of a group of soldiers from all over the world in the waning days of the Second World War who find themselves trapped together in this underground bunker uh, that has caved in on itself. And as they try to get out, uh, alliances and tensions form, many of them unlikely. And, you know, it's got all the stuff that you want from an Ulmer movie, the expressionist lighting, yeah. the expressionist sets, but, but also... You just want to you just want to impose an autobiographical reading on it. You want to say, <laughs> "Omer is trapped in the cavern of his own making. This is his career." Exactly. <laughs> So number four, it's Club Havana. Club Havana is a film that came out the same year as Detour. It actually uh, came out right after Detour. It's often dismissed as, oh, that's the musical one that Elmer made. But it's actually a really tight, hour-long, grand hotel style. Like, there are a dozen characters all running around, all having their own problems, intersecting with each other. There's, like, a singer. There's a newlywed couple. There's, like, a gangster who's there. And someone else is trying to warn the police that he's there. Something you have to understand about Edgar G. Ulmer is in the 1940s in the Poverty Row movies, the one those ones that again were sold to theaters on a flat rate. Uh, the camera didn't move a lot. No, <laughs> but the ones that he worked with Eugene Shuftan, who was uncredited on the movies that he worked oh. on, even though he was supposedly the head cinematographer, he does keep the camera moving and he keeps it flowing in a way that you could almost assume that it was an MGM production. And it even ends in a way where it's like, whoa! It actually took me aback while I was watching it. An act of violence that happens on screen. So check out Club Havana. It's like all almost all the movies that we're talking about available in a really crummy copy on YouTube because it's never been properly released because it's in that gray market who owns the right zone. Towards the end of his life, Edgar G. 
Elmer uh, went to Texas and shooting on abandoned fairgrounds made two cheap science fiction movies back to back. The first one, The Amazing Transparent Man, has been not on, good. <laughs> it's been on Mystery Science Theater. I don't detect a lot of brilliance in it, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, perhaps repeated viewings will <laughs> show some. Letters. Let me just fool myself as I watch this over and over again. But the other one, Beyond the Time Barrier, I love. So good, but you have to be ready for a level of minimalism in your uh, cinematic taste if you want to enjoy this picture. It's about an astronaut who does indeed break the time barrier and finds himself in like 22, 24 or whatever. But <laughs> the year 2009. <laughs> but what makes this movie so special is, you know, shooting on these abandoned fairgrounds, he creates this like bargain basement metropolis look. Ah, I can't escape my prison. And it's just like a bare, no walls, but giant um, set. The visual idea of the film is triangles. Mm-hmm. Every All over the set place. is dominated by triangles. It's not like there's a lot of stuff on the sets. Or a lot of stuff happening in the movie. <laughs> but what stuff there is on the sets is so kind of evocatively arranged. I can only imagine being a kid and stumbling upon this on Sunday and then the ending coming around, which is so disturbing. <laughs> I'm not going to spoil it here, but it's like... Whoa. By the way, an Elmer movie that we won't talk about in great detail, but that I want to mention is The Man from Planet X. Ugh. If you had to pick one of his minimalist films, I can understand going with Beyond the Time Barrier, but The Man from Planet X is probably more famous because of the iconic uh, alien design in it. Well, yeah, the alien design is pretty wacky. <laughs> yeah, a giant well, condom-headed guy. <laughs> <laughs> but also it's set on what are supposed to be like the Scottish Highlands. <laughs> and of course he can't do the Scottish Highlands, so it's just fog. Just nothing but fog on a black set. Fog. And <laughs> mm, pure I, I love it. Pure cinema. <laughs> now, number two that we have is People on Sunday. Uh, People on Sunday is a film that essentially every young person in Germany who loves cinema and would come to Hollywood and be famous worked on. The credited writer of the film is a guy named Billy Wilder. Fred Zinnemann, who would go on to direct High Noon, worked on the film as well. The co-director is Robert Siodmak, who became one of Hollywood's best film noir directors, doing The Killers, among other films. The cinematographers of the film... Yeah, uh, Eugene Shuftan, who we talked about, uh, who had worked on tons of big pictures. And they all made this movie, which is a kind of proto-neorealist, just following these young people who are not actors, going about their day on a Sunday. They go to the park, they hang out, they listen to some records, they have fun. There's no big dramatic incidents, but it's capturing a kind of flavor that cinema had not done in feature lengths form. Yeah, it's part Mm proto-neorealism and it's part city symphony. So it drifts away from the plot often to just record stuff that's happening in Berlin on a Sunday afternoon. And at the same time, you do get those Ulmer touches, like specific close-ups or maybe the little camera move here that just has that magic to them. And it's also capturing uh, Germany between World War I and World War II before everything went to shit. Right, right after the financial collapse, Mm. but before uh, a, a young leader yeah. uh, had had ascended to the throne. And the fact that it was all these young people that made it as well, who like scrounge up the dough just to bring their vision to the screen, makes it even that much more special. Especially when you consider they would come to Hollywood and be forced to just like, oh, what? You directed and this huge box office hit? Here, direct the C picture on a triple bill. But number one is a movie that uh, is neck and neck with Detour for me for my favorite Edgar G. Elmer movie. Damage Lives. Yeah, the, the venereal disease film. Uh, uh, the Naked Venus. The, yes, his uh, nudie cutie film. You know, the thing about The Naked Venus is... It's very sexy. Very sexy. <laughs> uh, it's not very good, but it has a couple of absolutely top-notch moments. Is there a little bit of fog? Okay, there's a scene where the camera is just like like going going by like a bunch of you know topless women as they as they have bow and arrows. <laughs> oh, really? And they're all like moving. lifting them up at the yeah, same time, yeah, probably? Yeah, and it's like... Compare this to any other nudist camp movie. Ugh, just about. like putting the camera down and like, no dicks, just yeah. boobs. Yeah. All right, let's just see it. And you know, it's still not very good, but it is the best nudist camp movie ever made <laughs> for what that's worth. Put that on the cover of the Blu-ray and toss it out into the world. But no, the other Ulmer masterpiece is The Black Cat, mm. the first film to unite Boris Frankenstein Karloff <laughs> and Bela Dracula Lugosi. Lugosi plays a mysterious traveler who is uh, returning to Eastern Europe to confront the uh, sinister man who betrayed him in the First World War. This sinister man is Boris Karloff, who has built an amazing Bauhaus mansion above a literal battlefield where 
uh, thousands of soldiers were just mowed to death. Uh, so that's kind of the metaphor of the film. And these two men are as much casualties of the war uh, as the people who died in it. And this is a film that came around the Universal Monster Cycle, but often gets pushed away because there's no, like, practical monsters. No Frankenstein, no Dracula, no werewolves. Just these two men clashing together in what, while there's no physical violence on screen, the stuff that's implied is horrifying. This is a film that had to go back to censor board over and over and over again until it could be released in the form that it is now. Well, it's it's quite pervy, mm-hmm. or as pervy as it could be for the early 30s, because while Bella was in a POW camp during the war, Boris ran off with his wife and daughter, and Boris keeps Bella's wife, uh, like, frozen in a glass tube, and he's sleeping with Bella's daughter now. And the film climaxes with one of the characters skinning the other character alive. After a satanic black mass. (laughs) That's right. And, you know, it's a film that, like, makes me feel something that I can't think of any other movie that does. It's like, there is just so much evil Mm -hmm. in here there's so much pain and misery uh that is bubbling beneath the surface of these two uh somewhat cordial characters and the only way that almer could get away from that was by starting an affair with his (laughs) boss's wife it also has i think my favorite moment in an edgar g elmer movie which is when boris karloff does this narration about how they're both victims of the war and the camera just drifts through the basement of his home while the Beethoven Seventh Symphony plays. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pure cinema. This is only a taste of Edgar G. Elmer, but if you're intrigued and you go and watch all these movies and you want to go deeper down into his filmography, The Strange Woman, which was a kind of like more polished picture that he did, or Ruthless. Yeah. Ruthless is okay. Ruthless is his uh, ripoff of Citizen Kane. (laughs) We're not even joking. You know you want to see that. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the channel and you can listen to me and Will talk about things like Edgar G. Elmer every week on the Important Cinema Club podcast. So I hope that we uh, laid the seeds of Ulmer Obsession and that you go out, buy Detour, and watch all of the movies that we talked about All of them. All of them. Every single one. St. Benny the Dip. (laughs) You keep going back to that. Isle of Forgotten Sins. Anything.